I'm sure that we've all been in conversations where the, the topic of religion or faith comes up. And the question is invariably asked, what religion or faith are you? Of course, the response will vary depending on the, the religious preference and their upbringing. The most common answer will be, well, I'm the Baptist faith or the Methodist faith, the Catholic faith, the Lutheran faith, on and on and on. Some even may go, may go to the default answer that is, well, since I'm not Jewish or Muslim, I must be a Christian. And honesty, for most people, is pretty much the way they were raised. They really don't get into it a lot for most people. But to a person who is diligently seeking the truth about Jesus, these human names that are attached to the body of Christ, the church, well, they can become confusing and may cause the person seeking the truth to believe that it really doesn't matter how you worship or even come to God. The Apostle Paul addresses the issue of Christ divided. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 and 13, he says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that I say each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or was he baptized in the name of Paul? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, the Apollo Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, said, There is one body, and we know that body to be the church. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Paul says that we are not to be divided into groups who follow humans, such as Paul, Apostle, Cephas, which is Peter. You realize that our Christian ancestors were originally called believers, disciples, and in Acts chapter 18 through chapter 24, we have numerous references to them being called people of the way. Acts 11, 26, we see that the believers, people of the way, the disciples, were first called Christians at Antioch. And it's ironic that in the first century, that was a derogatory, a derogatory term. Christian was a derogatory term. But as I read through the New Testament, I can't find a single reference to any disciple being called anything other than what we just read them being called. Disciples, believers, people of the way, and Christians especially. And we need to understand that just declaring oneself to be a Christian does not make them a Christian. No more than having tickets to your favorite sports team's events makes you a member of that team or wearing the regalia. And I'm sure today if you watch the Super Bowl, you'll see thousands of people with Chiefs or 49ers shirts. That doesn't make them a member of the team. I just can't declare myself to be a Christian. I can't declare myself to be something that I'm not. Now I realize in the age that we live in that men declare themselves to be women and women declare themselves to be men. It's a mixed up world out there. But as far as Christians are concerned, People that follow God, you can't declare yourself to be something that you're not. Several years ago, Cheryl and I drove to California. And while we were there, we dropped by my alma mater, San Jose State, just to show her around. Now, Cheryl graduated from Western Illinois, or as I like to call it, Walmart University. <laughs> I wanted to show her what a real university was, so we went to San Jose State. And Cheryl and I would banter back and forth as to which school was better. And Cheryl would say something, and I would always say, yeah, but you never went to San Jose State. And she would say, but I did go to San Jose State. You see, and technically she was correct. She did go to San Jose State. But she didn't fulfill the requirements established by the laws of California to be honestly and accurately a student, much less a graduate of San Jose State. 
And just for the record, Cheryl does concede that San Jose State is better than Western Illinois. But that brings us back to the situation that most people find themselves in. Simply declaring yourself to be a Christian doesn't make you one unless you have filled God's requirements to make you a Christian. And we find that through His Holy Word. We just can't wish ourselves into, into His family by declaring it. And we don't become a Christian through osmosis. The fact that someone in your family is a Christian or that someone knows a lot of Scripture does not fulfill the requirement to make them a Christian, a member of the body of Christ. And Scripture is clear on this. Scripture tells us that we are adopted into the family of God through baptism into Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to the Galatians, For all of you are sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Paul wrote to the church at Rome, touching on the same subject. In chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, he says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into his death, so that Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so that we too may walk in newness of life. So the scripture is clear on how we become one with Christ. That's through baptism. In the New Testament, every single act of conversion is followed by baptism into Christ. Now time doesn't permit us this morning to go through all of the uh, baptisms that we see and all of the conversions in the book of Acts and other books. That's not the purpose of the lesson. But I do want to read two passages since the Apostle Peter gets to the heart of the matter on salvation. On the day of Pentecost, after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, Peter preached the first gospel sermon. And these passages are well familiar to members of the church. They have been heard hundreds of times. Luke writes, and he tells us what the response was to Peter's sermon. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 38. Now when they heard this, meaning that the crucifixion of Christ, that they were responsible for it, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what must we do to be saved? Peter said, in this well-known verse, Repent and be baptized, each of you, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now listen to what Luke says next, and this is crucial to becoming a Christian. In Acts 2 and verse 47, Luke says, And the Lord added to the church daily as should be saved. The Lord added daily. They weren't voted into the church by human beings. There wasn't a poll taken to see the membership to see if they should be admitted. They didn't join the church. God added to the church once they fulfilled his requirements. Not the requirements established by men, but by God. Scripture is also clear that once we are baptized into Christ, we are then adopted into God's family. This is a choice that's made by an individual. No one can do this for you. Remember what we just read? Peter said, each of you be baptized in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, under the old law, a male child, when a child was born under the old law, they were either automatically became a Hebrew or a Jew, depending on that era. And of course, male child underwent circumcision after eight days in order to fulfill the requirements of the covenant between Abraham, his descendants, and God. In Genesis chapter 17, Verses 1 through 14, we're going to look at that in a few minutes, but that's where we find that requirement. But today, for those of us who hear God's word and obey it through baptism, the Apostle Paul has good news for us. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 5, he writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Okay, 
So now we know that we're in Christ through baptism. Verse 5 tells us, In love he, God, predestined us as adopted as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. That means we belong to Christ. We belong to God once we have been baptized into his family as an adopted child, according to the kind intentions of his will. See, God owns us as part of his family through Jesus Christ. Have you ever known anybody that has a friend that they're so close to that they consider them a brother, even though they're not a brother? When I was in law enforcement in California, we used to uh, stop individuals for questioning or whatever we were doing, and they would be with somebody else, and you'd ask them, what's your name? What's his name? Well, that, that's my brother. Well, how come he's got a different name than you? Well, that's my play brother. That's my play cousin. And you hear that all the time. But that individual does not have legal standing in the family. Just like individuals outside of God's family does not have legal standing within the family. And Paul continues with this idea of adoption, not only adding us to God's family, but making us heirs to Christ. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 7, he said, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that they might receive adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth his Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now there's that Aramaic term, Abba, would be, which means that intimate relationship that Jesus had with Christ. I'm sorry, what Jesus had with God. But that also gives us, as adopted sons, that we now have that intimate relationship with Christ. And remember that's that term, Abba, that Jesus used in the garden. Abba, Father, Abba, Father. In verse 7, Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So we have legal standing to go to God. Outside of the family, there's no legal standing. Now much in the news in the past few weeks was Prince Harry and his wife deciding to split from the royal family. Why we spend time on that, I have no idea. But they gave up or relinquished their rights to the royal family. They're no longer part of it. We don't want anything to do with it. Okay? But you see, Christians can do the same thing. You can be in the family, and you can walk away from God. We can turn our backs. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, when Paul is writing to Timothy, he's talking about this very item. And he says, Paul writes about Demas, who was once a faithful disciple of Christ and a companion of Paul. And Paul tells us the bad news that he wants Timothy to make every effort to come to him soon. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Think about this. Demas was once in the family of God. He has now turned his back on God. He has gone away. You know what the Apostle Peter refers that to? As a dog returning to his own vomit. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. But the good news for us is, that Paul says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor these present things, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heart, height, nor depth, nor any of the created things will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38 and 39. This, of course, as long as you remain faithful. You don't become like Demas. You know, since God, in his first dwellings with mankind, he has always wanted to establish that relationship with us. But he's always set the standards, the parameters for our conduct. And it's always been a unilateral uh, covenant. It's a one-way street, so to speak. We command, I'm sorry, God commands, we comply, the relationship is intact. There's no negotiating, there's no bargaining here on our position. Adam and Eve had one law to obey. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what happened when they didn't obey? 
they were cast out of the garden. We're going to read from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 14. And if you're using the Brown Pew Bible, it's page 11. And this is where God establishes the requirements for the covenant he will establish with Abraham. Beginning in verse 1. And as I read through these 14 verses, I'm going to emphasize certain words. Verse 1 says, When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Right off the bat, God establishes his position of authority. He is in charge. He is sovereign. I am Lord. I am God. He lets Abraham know, I am in charge here, Abraham. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Verse 3 says that Abraham, or Abram, as he was still known then, fell on his face. In the ancient world, falling on your face meant several things. He recognized the sovereign nature of God. He recognized that God was in charge. He recognized that God had total control over his being. He recognized that at any moment, anybody that this individual was prostate could take their life. They could do whatever they wanted to with him. Abraham recognized God was in charge. And we continue on. And God said, and Moses continues with verse 3, and he says, And God talked with him, saying, As for me and my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but you shall be called Abraham. For I have made, my, made you the father of multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. Verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Verse 8, I will give you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojourning, all of the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, at which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. Verse 12, every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is bought, born in the house or who is bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants, a servant who is born in your house who is bought from money, shall be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in the, your flesh as for an everlasting covenant. Verse 14 says, But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now, I'd like to break these passages down for just a minute. Notice how God refers to himself here, I, nine times, my, seven times, and me, five times. Me, myself, and I, in those 14 verses, 21 times. Me, myself, and I indicate God's ownership. This is God's covenant, his requirements. And God commands Abraham with, you shall do something, 11 times. You see, God is not asking Abraham. He is telling Abraham. These are commands that God is giving to Abraham. Notice here what God says again in verse 14. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. He has disobeyed my requirements to be part of my covenant. God is sort of saying if, if we can use today's language, this isn't Burger King, you can't have it your way. Mm -hmm. 
In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 16, is a well-known story that we all should know. It takes place before the transfiguration. Jesus and some of his disciples are up in Caesarea Philippi, and that's in the northern part of Israel. This is an area that's uh, governed by Herod Philip. This is the same Herod Philip's whose wife left him. You know, this is a little side note. But this is some of the stuff you'll, you'll learn if you take our biblical geography class next March. Um, so Herod Philip's wife leaves him, goes to marry Herod's brother, Philip Antipas. This is the relationship where John the Baptist condemns the adultery for which Herod's wife, Herod Antipas' wife, has John the Baptist beheaded. And this is the Herod Antipas that Jesus goes before during the, just prior to his crucifixion. Herod Antipas wants to see the miracles and everything. Jesus is not playing your game, so they send him back to Pilate. See how this, this whole thing all ties together? It's pretty neat, actually, when you get right down to it. God didn't take this requirement lightly. In fact, this covenant was so important that after generations of Israelites who had died wandering in the wilderness, that in Joshua chapter 5 we read where God instructed Joshua to circumcise all the males born in the wilderness during the period of wandering because they, because they hadn't been circumcised. Now this is an, a, a, an important point to understand, that unless we obey what God has instructed us to do, we can't ex we comply explicitly with the manner by which God establishes the New Testament covenant through Jesus, then we're not in a true covenantal relationship with God. And the only way to be in a biblically covenantal relationship with God is through baptism into Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. And in John chapter 1, 11, and 12, John tells us something else about this relationship. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He, Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. And he came to his own, that would be the Jews, and those who were in were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. John makes it clear that only some of the nation of Israel, those showing faith in Christ Jesus, were granted the right to become children of God. Just like Israel, Christians are in a covenant, we are a covenant people, brought, being bought, brought into the new covenant, made possible and valid by the application of Christ's shed blood. Luke chapter 22 I'm sorry, you, Luke chapter 20, verses 19 through 20. This is a passage we read a lot during communion. Luke tells us, And when he had taken some bread and given, it, given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup, and after he had eaten, saying, This is the cup which poured out for you in the new covenant, covenant in my blood. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 tells us, For you have been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 7, 23, Paul reminds the church at Corinth, You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. And in Paul's farewell letter to the Ephesian elders, recorded in Acts 20, 28 through 30, he admonishes them to keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he has bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw the disciples away from them. Isn't this what Jesus is telling his disciples in John 10, 1 through 3? Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of sheep but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber, but he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep will hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by his name, and he leads them out. And Jesus continues with, 
I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved, and he will go out and find good pasture. The thief comes in only to steal, to kill. I came that you may have life and life abundantly. I know Steve read that as part of his um, communion talk, but the interesting thing about that is, Chuck and I were talking about this this morning. These passages overlap because they come from where? One book. We don't have all these outside um, man-made, man-written books to tell us how to get to God. God has told us how to get to God. So what have we learned from today's lesson? Well, we know that Scripture tells us that claiming to be a Christian doesn't mean that we are one. We have to follow God's requirement for admission to his family, not man's. God deals with the individual in accepting them into his family. An individual hears the good news, the gospel, and exercises faith, and once baptized into Christ, they are called to be joint heirs with God's Son. Romans 8, 17, Hebrews 3, 1. And they are declared righteous by the word of truth. James 1, 18. By being baptized, we become Christians, begotten or produced of God's Spirit as his sons and daughters or children in God's family. Can you imagine that? You know, when you get out there, a lot of people are, they play, they, who's got the most famous relatives, etc., etc. Well, my relative is this, my relative is that. And you can proudly and honestly say, well, my brother is Jesus Christ. God is my Heavenly Father. You could say that, but I'll leave you with this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, that will be the Old Testament, having become a curse for us in order that Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. So if you're here today, I don't know the status of everybody in here, but if you're here today and you've never accepted God's invitation to become one of his children, a disciple, a believer, a person of the way, someone who is adopted into his family and has become a brother or sister to Jesus Christ, then I urge you, we all urge you, to obey his command and be baptized to be added to God's family. Chuck's going to lead us in an invitation song, so if there's anything that we can do for you, please come forward and let us know.